All right, I believe it's 11 o'clock and time to begin our second service today. So if we can uh, get everyone uh, to find their social distanced seat, we will uh, begin. It's so good to see people inside the building, even if we're in the gym today. Now we have turned the speakers to face one another today, trying to see if it'll take out some of the slap off the wall. Uh, Brian Birchfield told me to try that. So if, if it doesn't sound good, we'll, we'll switch it back. But uh, all right, but we'll go ahead and get, get started today. Brother Joe is going to come and bring a song and um, appreciate him very much. We're just bouncing around from one service to the next. And so next Sunday, by the way, we're going to have a baby dedication. So come and be prepared for that. Um, Tommy is finally getting dedicated. And after all this, no, I'm just joking. I couldn't help myself, but... He's had a baby. <laughs> now my mind went blank. But no, we will have a baby dedication uh, during the 11 o'clock service. And also we'll be honoring uh, uh, Kobe for uh, graduation as well. Next Sunday night, uh, we're privileged to host the Ministerial Association to do the bacc baccalaureate service for Cherville High School. And then uh, we've had a request. And it looks like we're going to be able to uh, butt me up just a hair for... Charles, we've had a request and uh, we're going to allow the uh, seniors to also use the ball field and, and we're going to make it, it will be a Christian service, but there's going to be a graduation service here on the 13th, so on the ball field. So we're excited about that and uh, just a tad. There we go. Can you hear me now? If you can't hear, move to the front row. All right. Good deal. Good. All right. So we're all in here now. I guess we're absorbing a little bit of sound. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, again, so glad to see you here with us today. And before I pray, uh, that was a trick. Before I pray, how many of you saw the orange markers in the parking lot and around the side? Hey, those are from the construction company. They're marking off where they're going to begin taking up uh, the parking lot and all those things. Is that not exciting to see those markers in place and know that we're just weeks away from groundbreaking here at Shady Grove. God is so good. We'll be telling you exactly when that's going to happen. Hopefully next week we'll know that exact date, but uh, hopefully we'll know by tomorrow. So looking forward to that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you and just thank you for the privilege to come back here in this gym today to worship you and to adore your holy name. Father God, we just thank you, most importantly, that you loved us enough that you gave your son who gave his life that we could be forgiven of our sins. We ask you now to have your way in this service, to bless us as only you can. I pray that you take the offering, use it for the upbuilding of thy kingdom. God, use us and guide us. Keep us in your will, God, that will not be in your way. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm just gonna just gonna sing a a hymn from from our hymn book this morning, and uh, I've been I'm, I want to say uh, thank you first to uh, to those folks of you that uh, that have helped us out in the, in the singing, and some of you want to continue doing that. Uh, you're more than welcome. Let me know. Uh, I got Daryl lined up for us in a couple of weeks. We've got a special uh, song for uh, next Sunday morning in here but uh we don't we don't always have things covered for the nine o'clock service so if some of y'all feel like singing at nine o'clock in the morning let me know or if you want to rat on somebody else and volunteer them uh, i'll be glad to be uh, in, involved in that too but uh just remember if you don't if you don't volunteer me or some, uh, don't volunteer yourself or somebody you're gonna have to listen to me all right <laughs> but uh no i this is this is an old, an old hymn that uh and I, I hope it'll it'll mean something to you. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to proclaim, and from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. Seeking sand, he lifted me with tender hand. He lifted me 
From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. He called me long before I heard, before my sinful heart was stirred. But when I took him at his word, forgiven he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light. Then it will be ready to start. It's called my Bible. <laughs> it's bad when you walk to the pulpit and your sword's missing, isn't it? All right, we might need this. If you've got your Bibles, though, we're going to be back in Ephesians chapter number four today. Ephesians chapter number four. And uh, we're going to pick up there in verse number seven. Ephesians chapter number four, I'm going to begin reading in verse number seven. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We'll hold there for just a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you take the reading of your word. God, I pray that you will bless it, will open up our hearts and our minds that we may see and hear of you. God, use us and guide us as only you can. We give ourselves to you this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How's the sound? Is it too much? Okay. Well, today as we move on in Ephesians, I want to look at the gifts of unity. The gifts of unity. I need more space up here. <laughs> As we think about the gifts of unity, do you realize that Christians can enjoy a wonderful unity together with one another? Now, oftentimes we think about Christians fighting and feuding over small things like the color of walls and, you know, whether the pews are padded or wooden. But we can have wonderful unity together. Our bond is in Christ, and that is the reason that we can share a wonderful unity. I've always heard the old saying, blessed be the tie that binds. We need to be bound together in unity. And yet, we also find that we're different from one another. And we should be. We talked about the graces of unity. Those are the things that we should have in common. In verse number two of this same chapter, we looked at those words, lowliness, not pride, 
Gentleness, meekness, not weakness. Long-suffering, not being defensive. And we saw that word love. Well, that's not bad at all, is it? We looked at the grounds of unity last week. They're a must for us to have in common. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Those are the grounds of unity. But the gifts of unity are where we differ from one another. You see, there is strength in diversity. We can have diversity in our gifts and still have unity and get along. We can still have the grace and, and still have the grounds of unity. And so think about this because there's great strength in the diversity of the body of believers. We are not to be cookie cutter Christians. We don't have to all be stamped out and, and look the same. We're not the same shape. You know, we're, we're not the same flavor. Our church is not supposed to be a melting pot, but a salad bowl. And in a salad bowl, you've got all these different components, these different ingredients that complement one or the other. Each part of the body has got to work together in tandem. I, I talked to the church this morning about a tandem bicycle. Do have you ever seen a tandem bicycle? I mean, it can have two or three or four seats. And usually what happens to that brother Tom is the person in the front that is steering usually is also the one that's pedaling. And they're the ones that's keeping it going. But the goal of a tandem bicycle is everybody can carry the load. So number two, number three, number four, they all could be pedaling to get you up the hill or put on the brakes to get a stop. But usually it's just the one. But God's called us as a church not to let one or two do all the work, but for us together to work. So we need to work in unity. And when we talk about unity, we think about this great nation that we live in. I've got to ask you a question this morning. Do you believe that America is going to survive this great culture change that we're going through within our shores? I mean, not only are we seeing culture change, but we've seen the things of the virus and now we're seeing rioting. And, and, and what does rioting get us, guys? Nothing. It's one thing to protest in our beliefs. It's another thing to tear up the stuff that's around us. I don't believe God's in that at all. But will, can America get through all this? Can America get through all just the culture change? And when I talk about that, I mean the things that we used to be ashamed of. The things that we should be ashamed about are now proudly paraded through the streets. It's time that we wake up, America. Think about it. Even churches in our nation are changing spiritually. And not for the better. In the book of Revelation, we find seven letters over there that were written to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter number 3. And each represent a period of church history. And yet we know that all seven types of churches will be in any one given period. But each represents a period of history. But as we look at this, we need to know this. We live in the seventh church that is spoken of, the seventh period, the Laodicean church. The lukewarm church. You see, they believe, that's the time period that we live in. And according to the Bible, they believed the right thing, but they were not on fire to do anything with what they believed. That could describe a lot of churches today. They believe the right thing, but not on fire to spread that gospel and to get it around the world. And then another church that we see in that those seven letters is the liberal church of Sardis. They were alive in name only, yet they had a few within their walls who were genuine believers. They were a has-been church, a church that used to stand for the graces and the grounds of unity, but no longer. They no longer believe the right thing. Now, can I ask you a question? Which is worse? To believe the wrong thing or to believe the right thing and not be excited about it? Which is worse? Huh. Huh. It's kind of amazing because when you look at the words of Jesus Christ, well, he said he'd rather that we be cold, that we be that liberal dead church, doctrinally, you know, wrong, than to be lukewarm. As a matter of fact, he said if we were lukewarm, that it would make him sick on his stomach. He'd spew us out of his mouth. If you don't understand what that means, he'd throw us up, right? And so 
He says it's worse to know the right thing and not do anything about it. Do you remember Abraham in the Old Testament when he took his son Isaac up onto the mountain to sacrifice him? Isaac said to Abraham, his father, he looked around and he said, and he said, Father, hey, we have wood and we have fire. But where is the lamb? Today, we would say, hey, we have the wood, the cross. We have the lamb, Jesus Christ. But where is the fire? Where is the fire? We need to get excited about what God has done for us and about our salvation. And we need to tell other people about it. And, you know, we can't just stand by when the world's falling apart and be silent. God is calling us Christians to speak, to give him glory. Where? Where is the fire? I think about that over and over and over. Where is the fire? If there's one church that will not only survive the century that we're living in, the cultural change that we're seeing before our eyes. There is one church that will not only survive, but the Bible teaches us that they'll thrive. And that was the Philadelphian kind of church. You see, the church of Philadelphia, they, they kept God's word. They did not deny his name. I mean, they were excited. And Jesus said, he said, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. Now that's a church that is united by the graces and the grounds of unity, full of people who possess the gift of unity. And that's what we're studying about right now. You see, there's some reasons that this church will not only survive, but thrive. And I believe Shady Grove that we have the ingredients to not only survive, but to thrive. You see, first of all, we find we have a glorified master. Secondly, we have a gifted membership. Third, we have the gift of ministers. And fourthly, we have a growing measure. Let's look at that glorified master. We look there in verses 7 through 10 that we've already read. And there's various interpretations of these verses here. But I believe that the one I'm giving you today is the very commonly accepted conservative position. But listen, before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Old Testament saints that died in the Lord, the Bible teaches us they went to a place called paradise in the heart of the earth, known as Abraham's bosom. It's not heaven, but a holding place until Christ's redemption was complete. And Jesus, he told the thief on the cross, by the way, before, his sacri before he died on the cross, Jesus told the thief on the cross that believed in him, today you will be with me in paradise. But in that same locale, yet separated aside, away from the paradise, was Hades, interpreted hell, different place, but also a holding place of torment where the lost awaited the great white throne judgment. Now, the great white throne of judgment is where they stand before God. And when they're tried and convicted before the Lord, they'll be thrown into Gehenna, the lake of fire. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 13 through 15, the Bible says this. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now we jump over to the book of Luke in chapter number 16 and we see the story there of a rich man and Lazarus. Now think about this because this is not a parable that you're reading there. This is a real occurrence. And, and we know that one, one went to paradise and one went to Hades, right? Now think about this. We see this great gulf between the two. And yet both sides could see each other. But when we go back to our text, verses 9 through 10 that we've already read. During the three days after Jesus died on the cross, his spirit descended into this place. 
delivering those in paradise to be part of his resurrection. Those who had followed him and believed, you know, in God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18 and 19, it says, For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, he preached to the spirits in prison. Now, that would be in Hades, right? Now, think about it. He's addressing those in Hades. Now, this is before the dispensation of grace that we live in now, right? And so he goes after he's died on the cross, those three days, and he's preaching to them there. Now, what might he have preached? Well, I don't know, Brother Tommy, but perhaps he was preaching victory over death because he was about to show them that. He was about to show them that. And so this is our glorified master that we see here that went and led those from paradise, that went and led those, you know, from Hades there that believed on him. But think about it. We don't get that chance now. We have the Holy Spirit here to call us and to let us know that we need a Savior. We get to do it in this life. Now, listen with me, church. Here we see the glorified master. He has victory over sin, over death, over hell. And that's why the true church can thrive in change. Hey, churches have always thrived in change. We can do that today if we'll follow after the Savior who is almighty and all powerful. If he can work even after his life being laid down on the cross of Calvary before he resurrected, he can still work today. Amen. And we can get more and more in that, but we're going to focus more on the gifts today than, than that passage. But the second thing that we see here is this. We have a gifted membership. I'm not talking about the ones that sing, Brother Daryl and, you know, Kathy and so forth. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the ones that can decorate the church and make it beautiful, Sister Stacy. They are gifted in a way, in a special way, but that's not really what we're focusing on here when we think about this gifted membership. You look in verses 7 through 8, every believer has at least one spiritual gift. What is yours? You can read about those over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, but, but what is yours? But here's the thing. Don't confuse your gift with talents of natural ability. Don't, don't confuse it with that, which come from our natural birth. Because spiritual gifts are given at the new birth. Now, I'm not saying that some of our singers aren't singing spiritually, because they do, but some people can just do you know, some ball players, Brother Tommy, they do it because it just comes natural to them. Don't get natural ability and gifts mixed up. Because you see, God takes the small things and blesses it mightily with the spiritual gifts. We look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. The Bible says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of us all. God has gifted you. For the purpose of profiting the whole body. It's not just for you. But it's to bless the whole body. Without our differing gifts within the body of Christ. We wouldn't have any diversity would we? You see God's not only given us unity. But he's also given us harmony. But he's given us different gifts. And we're to use them to edify one another, to lift each other up. So when I walk, every part of my body works together. If my big toe decides to take the day off, it's going to throw off my balance, right? It's going to be hard for me to, to get anywhere. I, I never will forget when I was uh, doing the youth at Providence, Brother Joe, you're over there. And uh, we'd go every year up to uh, Whitewater Rapids. Have you ever noticed we don't let our teens go white water rafting? Because the preachers got smart and thinks that's crazy. We could have got killed. But every year we'd go and I'd always get stuck with ones that had never been before. 
and you know you're guiding them and you're telling them which way to row and what to do and when to do it and and every once in a while you'd start spinning around in a circle because when they're supposed to be rowing or not rowing they're doing the opposite and if you're not working together you're working against each other it's the same way with the church we can sit here and go round and around and around in circles working against one another but if we work together we use the gifts that God has given us. Oh, what a blessing it can be. Oh, how many souls can be reached for the kingdom of God. Why is that important? I don't know about you, but I've got a brother and sister that really need Jesus. Hey, how many of you have got some loved ones out there or even some friends or acquaintances you'd like to see them see Jesus? Well, listen, if we can't even get along down at the church house, how are we going to be blessed enough to go and share the gospel and someone respond to us? So think about this. We've got to work together. We've got to make sure that we're doing the right thing. We've got to be careful about laying aside our gifts too. Because when we lay aside our gifts, it's not helping anybody. You know, our gifts are not toys to be played with. But tools to work with and weapons to fight with. And our fight is against the forces of evil. It's not against one another. So we've got to make sure that we're working together to fight the forces of evil. They're all around us. And then there's a third thing that we see here. We have the gift of ministers. Now, I know what you're saying right now. Well, you know that Dale, he thinks he's God's gift to us. I, I don't think that. I, I know that. <laughs> The truth of the matter is, it's not just talking about preachers here. It's talking about all of us. We all are ministers in some way in different, different levels. And so, you know, in the Bible, we find the apostles and we find the prophets that did the foundational work. And their ministry was authenticated with miracles. Now, I don't believe anybody's filling their office today. But today, we're building on the foundations there is that office, but we're building on the foundations they've already laid. We're not having to write a new path, in other words. That's what I mean by that. I look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. The last half of verse 19, the Bible says, Fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse 10 says, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part will be done away with. You know, evangelists have a special gift of reaping the harvest of lost souls. Like Philip in Acts chapter number 8, who, who traveled around, he won souls, and then he left that town to go wherever God led him. And every minister should do the work of an evangelist. In 2 Timothy 4 or 5, the Bible says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Now hold on. Every Christian is under the great commission to do the work of an evangelist. Now, not just the preacher. Every Christian, if you've asked Jesus into your heart, then you're under the great commission to do the work of an evangelist. Doesn't mean you've got to stand up here and preach. But you can tell someone what happened to you. Amen? We can share the good news of Jesus Christ. We can put shoe leather to the gospel. You know, every Christian is under the great commission. Pastors and teachers... No longer some, but all. You know, it's the same office, but two different ministries of it. Now, as a pastor, Brother Jack, I'm supposed to not only lead the flock as the pastor, but also to feed the flock as a teacher. Right? In other words, I said this earlier, and <laughs> Jeff about fell off the steps. It's my job to lead and to feed and your job to swallow and follow. You'll catch that in a minute. Amen. You know what though? Let me just say this. We all need to be studying the word. That way when we're led we'll know we're going in the right direction. Amen. We need to know that what we're receiving is the word of God. 
and nothing else. But honestly, the truth is, as a pastor, I'm to lead you to lush green pastures in the word in such a way that you can feed on it. And in such a way that you can take it and share it. Take it and share it. You know, I was taught, Brother Tom, to make a, a conscious decision to focus my work in the study of the word of God. When I prepare a sermon, whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night, to put just as much effort in it. Why? Because we need to be able to bring something good to the people that they will receive and grow from, be interested in. We shouldn't do anything half-heartedly. And I praise God that apparently we're doing something right. Because thousands of people outside of these church walls are tuning in to Shady Grove every week. Every week there's folks from India, and Peru, and all, just about every state in the nation. We praise God for that. But don't ever let us get to big head. Because just a servant in mind. Just a servant in mind. But you might say, well, well, preacher, why do you got to put all that effort in? Why do you have to feed so well? Is it so they can become spiritually fat? Not at all. We look down in verse number 12. We've not got there just yet. But the saints are to do the work of the ministry. Brother Tommy, when you and Brother Hull and Brother Quay, when you guys get ready to go out and split some wood, don't you go and eat? I know you do. You go and eat first. You got to get your fuel in. You got to make sure that when you begin to start, you don't have to stop because you're too weak and you're too weary to bust that wood. Hey, Christians, we need to feed on the word. We need to feed on what God has for us so that we're not too weak and too weary when we get out there to do the task that he's called us to do. Every one of us can tell someone else about what Jesus has done in our life. But nobody's going to listen to us unless we're walking in these grounds of unity. Unless we're getting along ourselves. Who'd want to listen to a, a bunch of rowdy folks who are always fighting? But in verse number 12, it says, For the equipping of the saints, for the works of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, Brother John Roberts, before him and Kathy moved to Michigan, every week he would walk by me. He was one of the biggest encouragers I had at this church and absolutely miss him. Because every week he would walk by and he would say, Preacher, you put good feed in the trough. I've heard some other people use those terms. But he, every week he would encourage me. We need good feed in the trough. Not just from the preacher, but even from our people here. Some of you are teachers and leaders and mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas and there's people looking up to you. We gotta put good feed in the trough, so to speak. Good feed in the trough. You know what, when people visit our church, let me go to meddling a little bit. When people visit our church, what do you do to follow up with them? Oh, preacher, that's your job. Oh, oh, we got a care team and they write letters. What do you do to follow up with them? I mean, when you're in food line and you see a person that's been to the church, did you not let them know? Hey, we all could. And, and what if God gave you the opportunity to tell them a little bit of what Jesus has done for you? It's up to us all. You see, you say, no, I'm not equipped to do that. Well, you see, that's why we're here to equip you, to do it with us, amen? Every one of us can make a visit, make a call, tell someone about Jesus, pray, disciple a new convert, counsel with someone that's having a problem. And I told them earlier, they was looking at me cross-sided through the window. You, I can see you through the car windows. I told them earlier, though, some of you could do a better job at counseling in some situations than I can. Why? Because you've been there. You've been there. God is calling us to use our gifts to be a blessing to others. Yes, I do these things, but I don't do it because I'm a preacher. 
but because I'm a child of God. And every one of us has been called. As a matter of fact, before I was a preacher, I was doing these things before I was called to full-time ministry. That's not to brag on me. That's to say that's what God has called us to do. Every one of us. You know, here in a couple of weeks, few weeks, we we'll, we'll, should know a, a short time this week sometime. We're going to see uh, groundbreaking out here. They're going to start moving the parking lot. and They're going to start pouring a foundation. And, oh, it's going to get exciting around here. And people are going to be wondering up their chair on Kings Mountain of Bessemer City. What's going on at that little church out in the country? You know, look at that big old building that's going up. They must be doing something right. You know what the best compliment they could give us wouldn't be, hey, they're building a new building. Hey, they got generous givers down there. And we do. Praise God for it. The best compliment they could ever give is for them to go by and say, hey, that church down there is building something. Again. Let me tell you about them. They're on fire for Jesus. Hey, they're on fire for Jesus. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Not only that, they're getting along down there. They're doing the things God wants them to do without fighting and bickering and, and so forth. Wouldn't it be awesome just to be known as a soul-saving station? Hey, where the baptism stays full? Does that happen all the time? No. But it could if we walked in the grounds of unity and we got out and did what we're supposed to do using the spiritual gifts that God has given us. We can see a church that truly is on fire. On fire. A few years ago, you all remember we had a lightning strike right on this building. Lightning hit the cross as a bird nest in the back of that cross. It hit that thing and, you know, you know the rest of the story. I was at home. As a matter of fact, we just moved to town. And um, they was calling for a hell storm. And Felicia, she, she, a little, she liked her car. It wasn't that old then, you know. And um, we was moving in. We didn't have a car poured up. Yet. The garage was sitting full of stuff. He couldn't get in it. And Felicia said, uh, you think he'd mind if we just parked the car up under the breezeway at the church? And we was moving stuff. So we dropped her car off and under the breezeway. That storm hit and Miss Joe called me. Said, the church is on fire. We jumped in the truck to get down here as fast as we could. And actually, a car again, I believe. And, uh, and Felicia said, oh, goodness, my car is under there. She was worried about material things. Don't tell her I said that. But when we got down here, everybody and their brother was here. I've seen pictures on Facebook from people I don't even know who they were. They was coming by to see a church that was on fire. Wouldn't it be nice if people came by to see a church that was spiritually on fire instead of physically burning? And we praise God that he had our back that night and that was already, Brother Hull, your grandson, was in front of the church when the lightning hit in the fire truck going to get a tree that had fallen up here on the next road. So God had it in place that he could put the fire out before it ever got in the building. But the truth is, everybody talked about that. It made the newspaper... The church that was on fire. Church, we need to really get on fire. We need to take the things that we believe because we have the right stuff. And take it out to a lost and dying world. Take it to our loved ones to be unashamed. It's not about building big buildings, even though that's a blessing of God. But it's about reaching souls for Jesus. And if we fail to do that, we've failed it all. We've lost it all. Jesus is calling us today. You thought when the preacher started talking about unity, you'd get off the hook on all that other stuff. But Jesus has a way of giving it all to us, doesn't he? The reason we need unity is so we can get along, so we can work together to reach more people for Jesus. Amen? So that's why we need to do these things. Let me give you number four. I'm done. We have a growing measure. Let me read those verses. Verse number 13, Ephesians chapter 4. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, 
in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now think about that with me. The Bible says we have a growing measure. Now, what, what does that mean? There in verses 13 through 16, we find it's absolutely sobering when I look at that because this is kind of our progress report. How are we measuring up to those verses of what it's calling us Christians to do? Not just preachers, but Christians. How are we measuring up? We look in verse number 13 and it speaks of Christ's likeness there. Are we doing what is right? Are we doing what is right? And then in verse number 14, I see stability there. Avoiding what is wrong. Verses 15 and 16, we see cooperation. God has called us to work together. Do you realize we can get more done working together than we can individually or working against each other? God has called us to get to work and get some things accomplished. So this is walking in unity, church. As we talk about this, this is truly walking in unity. When we work together, when we use the gifts that God has given us to complement the others, and we reach a lost and dying world. Not only will we reach a lost and dying world, but we'll grow the body of Christ even on the inside. I don't know about you, but every time I open up the Word of God, I can learn something new. I can grow more and more. When we use those gifts to grow, oh, how stronger we are. The more we hear from God, the more we find favor in our lives from Him. But it all starts when we give our life to Jesus. You see, we can't have unity and we're not using spiritual gifts until we've asked Jesus into our heart to forgive us of our sins. If you've never done that, today would be a great day to pray the prayer and ask him to forgive you of your sins. But it's got to be more than just a prayer. You see, when we pray this prayer, it's a prayer that changes us from the inside out. Anybody can say a prayer, but only a true believer can become a Christian. By praying a prayer of forgiveness and accepting Christ forever. But you know, even Christians that have truly meant it and said it and know that they're one of God's children can grow weary and weak. It's time for us to no longer be weary and weak and to be lukewarm, but to get fired up. It's time for us to turn the heat up, Brother Jack. Draw the wood out and allow God to work through us time I don't know about you but our world is in a pickle I don't know what you think about that but I see over in 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 verse number 14 the Bible teaches us that we humble ourselves we cry out to God we pray that he'll forgive us of our sins heal our land church we need to unite on that as a matter of fact Lord willing this Wednesday that'll be our study on Wednesday night but right now, we're blessed. We're blessed here at this church. And Satan don't like that. We have an enemy and he wants to destroy us. He wants nothing more than to tear us down. And we've got to remember that God has already given us the weapons that we need to fight against the enemy. And it's not each other. It's Satan himself. What are we going to do about that? God is fixing to bless us, and as he blesses us, he's already blessed us. I shouldn't say fixing. He's already blessed us to get us to this point and to take us through. The devil don't like it. And if we truly get on fire about saved, getting souls saved, winning the lost, he really ain't going to like it even more. Do you care? Let's give the devil the black eye because we're on the winning side. Don't worry about what the world says. We're on the winning side. Today, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, what a wonderful day. 
Christian, today, if you found yourself weary and weak, it's hard to pray. You know, it's hard to just maintain your study on the, the Word of God or, or whatever it is that's caused you to drift away. You come back to Him. And then, Christian, I ask you this. Would you pray? Would you pray for our church to be a lighthouse? Would you pray for our country to be healed? Our nation? Would you pray for lost people to be saved? Brother Joe's on his way back. As he comes, we can social distance and pray. You can pray right where you're at. You can pray in your car. You can pray out loud and you can pray silently. But will you pray? I believe great things happen when God's people praise. Amen? I believe great things happen when God's people pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as Brother Joe comes around, I pray that you touch every heart. God, if there's one that's watching, one that's here that needs you, that needs your son Jesus as Savior, as Lord, as friend, then I pray today they would pray a simple prayer, trusting and believing in you with all their heart. Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner. Come into my life and make me your own. In Jesus' name. God, I pray if there's one here that, or watching, God, that they know you as Savior, but they've been far away. I pray today that they rekindle that fire with you. And God, I pray that you will heal our land, that you will use the church to rise up and to be your mouthpiece and your witness in the day where there is no hope. Use us and guide us in every way, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Joe, you come. If you have a need to come, you come. He, uh, he was speaking of the, uh, what Brother John said about the, you put good feet in the trough. Uh, I, it took me a little while. He told, he told that earlier this morning too. But, um, that's good stuff. You know, uh, I don't see, see Ronnie right now, but I know he and, and, and myself, if, uh, if we want to, want a good beef we're going to put it up ourselves, and we're going to put a little bit of that sweet stuff in the box you know for and uh that the master has given us that spiritually too goodness gentleness meekness kindness self-control and uh if we'll partake of those spiritual gifts it'll give us a sweet spirit and that's what this song's about There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and There's a second verse of that, but before I sing it, I'll tell you something to help you all. And I bless you all. Watch this little one right here. She lifts her hand in praise. She's happy. She's still young and she's still innocent. You know what? In God's eyes, we're just that way too. As dirty and bad as we are, we're just that innocent in his eyes. And I'm thankful for that. Bless her. I thank the Lord. She wouldn't even look at me two weeks ago. But uh, now she's looking at me and waving at me. Just think about that as I sing this second verse. I think you'll feel better. There are blessings you cannot receive Till you know Him in His fullness and 
and believe. You're the one to profit when you sing. I am going to walk with Jesus all the way. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Thank you, Brother Joe. Amen. Thank you, church. This Wednesday will be online at 7 o'clock. Uh, we know at least for next week we'll plan to do a drive-in service and a service at 11. We'll see how that goes from week to week. When they tear up the parking lot, we'll definitely be moving inside. And uh, maybe for a while we'll do a service, and we don't know how it's going to work, but maybe we'll do a service in the sanctuary and a service here at two for your comfort levels. And uh, I think some people are liking coming early too, so what a blessing. We'll, we'll do what we need to do for a while. But God is blessing. When we get the new building done, I believe we need to all come back together. And what a blessing that's going to be. God is good. Pray for the church. Go out and see those orange markers out there. If that don't get you excited, then, well, I don't know. But God, God is doing something great. But most importantly this week, let's pray. Pray, how can God use you in the midst of this church, in the midst of this crisis that's going on in our world? How can God use us collectively together to minister to those that are hurting? There's so many out there today that they don't have what you have. They're missing the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. And it's our job to take it out there and to tell them. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. We praise you. And we just ask your blessings upon us this week as we go. Lord, give us the strength to go, to tell, to share, and to show love. For that, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen.